warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I hope you can hear me, right? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, As-salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursaleen. So, respected students, uh, uh, the thing is very easy today. Uh, you don't have to worry much. Whatever uh, PowerPoint slide yesterday, I gave it to uh, Yusuf Jamil, and that's going to come for the examination. As far as exam is concerned, you don't have to worry at all. It will be most of the people get full marks or maybe one or two marks less, but most of, of you will score according to the PowerPoint. That's all. I'll try to explain the PowerPoint, but my intention is to give you a little more than uh, the practical pathology, which is related today, just because to understand more better the pathological process, what you have studied under Dr. Akbar, both the hepatitis, liver cirrhosis, as well as alcoholic uh, fatty liver. So we'll just try to go accordingly. If you want to uh, ask a question in between, you can stop me and, I, and you can ask me a question. Anyway, I think my students are already there, F6 and F12. We already interact uh, in, in our sessions. So this is the practical and it's very easy. Don't worry. So we'll start now. OK, now the intended learning objectives at the end of your study uh, this week, you should be able to Describe the gross and microscopic features of a liver with fatty changes. So this is what you're going to get in the exam. The fatty changes. Uh, very important of the liver and again the gross and the microscopic features of chronic hepatitis. OK, we usually take chronic hepatitis B as a prototypical uh, a good example or a model to understand the chronic hepatitis. But our intention is, of course, chronic hepatitis. OK, that we'll try to learn today. The fatty liver, of course. Chronic hepatitis, then we have a gross and microscopic features of liver cirrhosis, and this is your practical today. That's all. But we'll learn a little more to understand the uh, development of a disease in these three patterns of liver uh, pathology, which we call it fatty liver, chronic hepatitis and liver cirrhosis. That is what you get in the hospitals very commonly. Uh, you know, of course, my English is a little faster, but I'm trying to uh, be become a little slower also. But you many of the people understand, so uh, it doesn't matter much. So we'll try to understand the pattern of injuries. I've taken many slides from many places. You don't have to worry. That's only for your understanding. And the slides which I gave you is it will it'll come for the examination. That's all OK. So we go furthermore. OK, that's why this this slide indicates for the exam slides, three slides only. Don't worry, just relax. OK. Now, just before we go to this one, we we'll try to understand the normal liver. The liver actually is divided into lobules. Can you see the lobule over here? This is particularly a lobule. OK. Hexagonal lobule basically, you know, here at the end of the lobules, you have a uh, a sort of a portal tract and here in between you have a central uh, vein. OK, now you can see the central vein on the right side of your this thing, the central vein and you have the portal tract over here where you get the maximum amount of oxygenated blood. That is area number zone number one, zone number two and zone number three. This area becomes necrosed when the pathologies occur. So these are the basically the hepatocytes arranged in two layers or one layer like that in between you have a sinusoid. So the liver is actually divided into lobules. The center of the lobule is a central vein where you can see the central vein over here at the periphery of the lobule are the portal tracts. These are the portal tracts basically. Which are having a good oxygenation is this point. Functionally, the liver can be divided into three zones as I told you one, two, three. Uh, now based on the oxygen supply, of course, this area, the portal vein, uh, the hepatic artery, and you know, uh, and you know, uh, the bile duct. All this, th these things will have a lot of blood supply in this area. So this area is highly oxygenated. Okay. Now this is actually the limiting plate. You know, I'll try to show you. This will make you understand many things of hepatitis. So uh, the zone A actually encircles the portal tract where the high level of oxygenated blood is there. Uh, from the hepatic arteries. OK, zone three at the near the central vein, you can see over here where oxygenation is 
poor and zone two in between. That is the idea. We'll go furthermore. I copied few of the diagrams from the other area. This is your uh, one of the diagrams from the PowerPoint. Okay. Right. You can see the hexagon very clearly. Lobule. Okay. You can see the portal vein, portal tract, and the central vein very clearly. Okay. Now this I copied from the area which is a little more zoomed in. All these are uh, one or two layered of hepatocytes, very clearly large ones, and in between you have the uh, uh, sinusoids. Okay, it's very important to understand. So, 60 to 70 percent of the blood supply from the gut, from the gut GID, passes through the uh, liver. That is, we have the different eight segments. You know, all this, you know, digestible amino acids, all such things to pass through it. So, hepatocytes are arranged in, in the plates, two cell thick. And in between, I told you these are the sinusoids. Then I told you this one, this one, the area, you know, this area, the sinusoid which contains the kupfer cells, the macrophages, as well as the endothelial cells. And here there's a small space called space of DSA, and it contains a cell called stellate cell. You should know it. This is actually important for MCQ also, but as a knowledge, this will help in fibrogenesis in cases of development of. Uh, what you call a cirrhosis of liver. So this basically is the thing. So you should know what does the portal tract contain. It contains the portal vein, biliary duct, and the hepatic artery. So that's the idea. Okay. Now again, a little more with a, a special staining. We call it basin trichom. You can see the bile duct like this. And I just try to draw it. It'll it'll be like that only. And when a little collapse, then it will be the portal vein over here. This one, this is the bile duct, and the hepatic artery over here. It will be somewhat little collapse, you know, like that. And this is the bile duct. So this is the area where have, you have a lot of blood supply. I told you almost 60, 60 to 70 percent of the blood supply from the gut passes through the liver, and it contains all uh, deaminated uh, or digestible amino acids, all areas. Okay, this is very important. Okay, now again, little more better diagram from the textbook you can see the portal vein this is the basically the portal vein uh, bile duct and the hepatic artery okay this is the area and you can see this limiting plate over here now this particular area will be disturbed and the architecture will be disturbed in both in the cirrhosis as well as hepatitis and we get the steatosis these kind of cells you know more clear cells become more as it occurs in the alcoholic hepatitis and steatosis, all such things will be seen uh, subsequently. Okay. Now, this is a very good diagram. I just wanted to show you the lobule, which I've already showed you the hexagonal lobule. Okay. All this like a hexagonal lobule, such that your normal should be good to understand the abnormal. We have a central vein. All this area contains the portal tract. Okay. These are the portal tracts. This is basically a functional unit of the uh, liver. Okay. Now you can see over here at this area, the central vein, the zone is three, two, and one. And this area is highly oxygenated. Okay. This area, like that, Yanni. And the acinus, when you divide the liver into acinus, the zone number three indicative of progressively decreasing oxygen supply. It's obvious, very logical. Okay. If you don't see or don't uh, want to repeat the slide, you just tell me. I'm going a little slow for your understanding. You have another zonal area where you have the central uh, vein. We have this area, the zone three, which is in which this the toxic substances as well as the hemodynamic disturbances do occur over here. And especially in the portal tract, the bridging, in, especially in the viral hepatitis of B and C, this area will be affected. We call it bridging and uh, area and the bridging fibrosis also do occur. And this area contains a lot of uh, inflammatory cells in viral hepatitis. So this is basically a portal tract. You can see over here very clearly, right? And what will happen is, uh, especially in autoimmune hepatitis, there will be some sort of a piecemeal necrosis. And, and you can see focalized or uh, single cell necrosis. We call it apoptosis. And this, you know, you people might have read in the general pathology where the single cell necrosis uh, without inflammatory cells surrounding. But usually the inflammatory cells you see uh, disturbing the limiting plate of the portal tract and uh, obscuring that area and going into the hepatocyte area where you can see a lot of necrotic cells. Okay. 
Now, the liver lobules, I told you, the most of the blood supply is from the portal veins, right? And it is a deoxidant blood from the GI tract, all the digested material going. So this is the 80%. And the hepatic artery is 20%. So 60 to 70% of the GI tract uh, blood goes through the liver. This one important area. So one drainage vessel, hepatic veins, uh, carry processed blood supply away from the liver. So away from the liver, only one. Towards the liver, it is two. You should know this one. So, and of course, we have a bile duct, okay? Now, this is a very good diagram. As I told you, when you consider this area as a portal tract, you have the portal vein, bile duct, and the hepatic artery. There's a well oxygen area called zone one. There's a zone two and zone three, and you have the hepatic vein or central lobular vein. So, this is area is called periportal. Because why I'm telling this, this when you just pick up the robins, your basic robins, which I always tell my students to buy from the jerry, is around 200 riyals or 250 riyals, buy it. Or otherwise, I'll send you the PDF. I have a PDF, or you can ask my uh, F6, F12 people. I've already sent to them. Read that very, don't read each and every page, but read the important areas, okay? Like hepatitis, liver cirrhosis, uh, alcoholic hepatitis, that area. So this is the mid zone area. And we call it, uh, we use these terms in the textbook. In a central lobular area, you should know it, right? Okay. Liver zones, I told you, periportal. I just, uh, you know, very important. Now, this periportal area is very important for the viral hepatitis first. Now, this is very important for your understanding. In a clinical setup, when you go into, into the fourth year, next year, when you understand the viral hepatitis in the ward, seeing the patient there, practically, then you think of, uh, what the disease is going on inside. You know, if a, if there's a good doctor with good pathology understanding, he actually experiences the lesion visually. Whereas the doctors with poor pathology only think of the lesion. He actually experiences the lesion visually under the microscope and uh, by seeing the diagram. So, okay, this is called periportal. Now, see the central lobular zone number three, furthest from the blood supply. Now, this is actually vulnerable to the ischemia where the blood supply is less or blood supply is cutting off. Now, this is a good example is the alcoholic liver disease, which we are going to study today, the fatty liver, okay? It's very, very important. The fat accumulation begins here in alcoholic liver disease. Now, there's a high concentration of P450 system. Now, you should know. Go to physiology and pathology. Read this area, P450 enzymes, hepatocytes, especially the metabolizing the drugs. Because many of the drugs, even the Panadol, what you take, will be affected, uh, affecting the hepatocytes as well. All those uh, musakkans and all this uh, analgesics and non steroidal anti-inflammatory, apart from the chemotherapeutic agents, apart from all those drugs which are used in the, as an anti-epileptic, all these things are going to affect the uh, hepatocytes. These cells are very vulnerable to many of the drugs, as well as well vulnerable to the ischemia, as well as vulnerable to the infection, especially the viral hepatitis, okay? We go furthermore. Now, this is again a very good diagram, not, not for examination. You can see the three dimensional one. You can see the central vein over here. All these uh, cords and cords and uh, of hepatocytes over here very clearly. And you can see at the portal tract, you can see the bile duct, okay, interlobular portal vein, branches of hepatic artery. And this area, you can see this area, I'm just coloring it. This area is the sinusoid. <laughs> which contains a lot of kupfer cells, macrophages, and endothelial cells. What does the sinusoid contain? The kupfer cells, the macrophages, and the endothelial cells. Well, it's very important, okay? We go furthermore. Now you can see if you just cut like, it like a cake, you can see the central vein in a three-dimensional area and the, and the importance of the sinusoids and the importance of the portal tract in front of you. Now, this is actually taken a cross section. You can see over here, these, is for, for example, I just marked like that. This is basically a hepatocyte with the nucleus over here. You can see, and this is basically the sinusoidal area. Okay. Uh, this contains the Kupfer cell over here very clearly. Okay. And a discontinuous endothelium is there. And between these cells, there's an Eto cell. Very important. Eto cell. Okay. And here is a small bile canonical is coming over here. So this is actually for your understanding to understand. Now, if you read like this, then it will be very easy for you to read the textbooks. I always tell, even I tell my colleagues, all my professors there, that encourage the students to read at least 
the chapters which you are teaching from the textbook. OK. Now again, this one I just divided into the, into the zones. Basically, you can see over here the lobule, the central lobular zone three, zone two, zone one in a three dimensional area. And you can see a very clear cut portal vein at the corners of a lobule. OK, now this becomes very easy for you. And again, you can see from here this basically central vein, the zone three, the zone two and the zone one because it is very near to the portal tract, right? This is the area and you can see the flow of the blood from from the central vein towards the portal tract and from the portal tract. You can see the hepatic artery flowing like that and the central vein flowing like that. So this is very, very important to understand. Now this basically I just copied from one of the diagrams. And uh, now this basically, you know, can you see over here just to uh, illustrate for you be before we start our uh, examinations? I see this area. This it totally architecture is distorted, right? And if you consider this area. Just color this area. Now this all all fibrosis over here, right? And this is the area of the hepatocytes here again a fibrosis. So basically, you know, this is a liver cirrhosis in chronic hepatitis. This photomicrograph of a liver tissue of a patient with chronic hepatitis B. OK, there is total loss of tissue architecture. That's the idea. Don't have to go into details. Tissue architecture is totally lost. OK, uh, and even the hepatic lobule, you know, you know, basically what we discussed the lobule like that, that architecture is totally lost. That's the idea. And instead the fibrous septae are formed. You can see the fibrous septae. These are the fibrous septae and they're going to become a, a fibrosis in future. OK. And this is again, you know, the overlay of the fibrosis, the same diagram you can see over here. This area, the green area is the same diagram, like the previous one, but the green I just colored it for the understanding of the cirrhosis that is fibrosis. OK. Now this is a basically a very small one slide for the liver functions. You can uh, because you have the this thing uh, uh, or this video, you can just go through it. You can see a space of DC containing the stellate cell. You can see the stellate cell over here. This makes the fibrous tissue space of DC here. Kupfer cells in the in the sinusoid and all these the hepatocytes, all such areas and all these the different functions of liver, which has the power of removing the potentially toxic byproducts of me medications and it metabolizes the breakdown of a lot of nutrients, food that produces energy. It helps the body to fight infections from removing the bacteria from the blood. It, it, it prevents shortages of nutrients which are stored over there in the form of vitamins, minerals and sugars and produces most proteins needed by the body. Such an important function is also a filter. It produces bile, a compound needed to digest fat and absorb a lot of vitamin A, D, A, E, A, A, D, E, N, K. Fat soluble vitamins, very, very important. It produces substances that uh, actually regulate the blood clotting mechanisms. So this is the idea. We now this this is your diagram uh, in from your uh, slide. So, so it's what is happening in the fatty chain? So we are taking up the first slide over here. The fatty chain of the liver. The liver is slightly enlarged. We call it hepatomegaly, right? It has a pale yellow. Usually it is whitish, little whitish in color. But when it becomes pale yellow, uh, or we can see over here appearance seen both the capsule this is the capsule and this is the cut surface. Okay. Uh, this uniform change is consistent with fatty change. Now, for example, if a good radiologist comes and scans your liver in the ultrasound scan or sonography, uh, most of us will have a little fatty change because we eat a lot of uh, a red mutton or red meat. You know, we accumulate little fat in the liver, but that doesn't matter for most of the Muslims. We eat it, but it's not going to uh, affect much. But when it, the fatty change becomes more, of course, it has. Uh, causes disturbance. So whenever you have a uh, liver, actually we are supposed to show you in the practical the liver in my hand. We usually demonstrate in our country, India. Uh, we have a lot of uh, different liver cut cut sections. We try to demonstrate. We try to see first how to describe our liver pathology. We uh, you can go and refer the pathology workbook. A lot of workbooks on the internet also. You you should first describe the shape of the liver, the size of the liver the color of the liver, the outer surface, is it nodular or smooth? The cut surface, how does it look? It is uniformly colorful like this here, yellowish, or it has different colors. All these things when, when you are in a pathology department or when you are doing a research, you are supposed to grossly 
you are supposed to grossly examine the each and every organ. Now you are trying to examine the, uh, you know, what you call it, the liver. So now you are a pathologist. Suppose well, after this grossly examining, you take a small piece like that and like this piece of the yellow and you send it to the histopathological examination. It gets processed and after two days or three days, it comes uh, and you can see, put the slide under the microscope. You try to see what changes are there. Are there fatty changes or are there uh, hep uh, hepatitis infective changes? Inflammation is there or are there serotic changes? That's what you got to look. look that's all. OK, now this is one of your slides in the examination and it's very easy when you get this. Uh, we we ask, ask the question, what is the diagnosis? And we can ask one or two questions from you. Uh, we ask you, what is this particular uh, cell with, with the lipid vacuole? You should say this is, a, uh, this is basically a hepatocyte accumulated with a lipid vacuole within the hepatocytes in a case of fatty change. One of the commonest cause of fatty change, we will ask you in the, in the oral exam, if you chef away, you can tell clearly alcohol. Uh, so you can see a fatty change. Basically, you can see here you can, will pick, pick up this particular area. You see, you know this, this is the uh, clear area and the nucleus is pushed to the corner, doing like a ring, okay? So this lipid accumulates when the lipoprotein uh, mechanism or lipoprotein transport system is totally disrupted when fatty acids accumulate due to alcoholic metabolism. When the person drinks the alcohol a lot, all these things will occur. So features, what are the, what are the, Features will ask you in the examination. You say the liver cells are enlarged, doctor, or clear vacuoles appear in the cytoplasm, and which is pushing the nucleus on one side, giving hepatocyte a signet ring appearance. So 10 out of 10, yani. So I'm I'm having the maximum khibra. So uh, that's what. So nothing to worry. Just see the slides, read these points more than enough. But you know, you people are mashallah. I've, I've seen uh, especially. Your classmates are very much interested uh, in understanding the knowledge, getting the knowledge, going to become a good clinician, to going to develop a more better clinical acumen. So what I'm teaching is for that one. OK, again, the same uh, one more slide in your uh, uh, this thing, histopathology slide. This is the histopathological appearance of a hepatic microvesicular steatosis. So I might ask you in the examination. Most probably I'll also be the examiner on the male side. Steatosis means fatty change. That's all. It's a microvesicular. When the vesicles are very small like that, okay, it's microvesicular. Then when the vesicles become larger, as I use some macrovesicular. So this is microscopically. When it becomes, when you go to grossly, it becomes nodular liver. Very, very easy. So the lipid accumulating in the hepatocytes as vacuoles. These vacuoles have a clear appearance. You can see all these clear cells. Just tell them clear cells, they give that. Okay, with H and E staining, that is called hematoxylin and eosin staining. This was discovered around 105 years before this stain, and it has the importance today itself as it was having the importance 100 years before. We call it hematoxylin eosin. This was one of the product was detected from the tree. So lovely discovery in this century. Okay, this again one of the. This is the, not from your. Uh, uh, course, I have taken it uh, extraordinarily. Uh, this is actually again uh, the fatty change over here. I told you fatty change. What do you call it? What do you call it? Steatosis. Steatosis. Don't forget these words. These are very important words for your understanding of the textbooks. Steatosis and a fatty change. So we can have some of the steatosis with some some inflammatory cells in between. So this is actually uh, I can call this a steatohepatitis. They are irregularly distributed uh, hepatocytes. We call it ballooned hepatocytes. You can see larger, smaller, or displacement of the cytoplasm. Okay, but the globular vacuoles inside all those clear vacuoles can also be seen. Okay, as well as diffusely distributed inflammatory uh, cells are there. So these kinds of different inflammatory cells can be in the small blue cells. These are the small, they are granulocytes and histiocytes, Cooper cells and other cells. So very clear cut example. And this again also this one. Uh, this is again more higher power. The same one you can see over here. A steato steatosis or steatohepatitis. Uh, signs of hepatitis and, uh, uh, injury due to steatohepatitis are seen in the form of you can see larger cells. 
the previous was little smaller now the, the cells are becoming larger show fina larger ada larger ala you some macro vesicular macro macro awal kan micro zai kida micro say zagir kabir usama macro vesicular hepatitis or steatosis okay the large droplets okay this also called ballooning degeneration or you can call it cellular swellings okay that is very important uh, intracytoplasmic inclusions do occur over here so it's easy it's no no problem for you this also very clearly you can see the steatoid hepatitis more larger cells and enlarged hepatocyte uh, basically with the all this is a cob web you can see this cob web inside for example i just try to focus for example take this one or take this one you can see this cob webbing inside cob webbing very clearly cob webbing like the cytoplasm and prominent eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusion now these inclusion inside see this one this inclusion they are called mallory bodies i think dr uh, uh, akbar has taught you this one mallory bodies okay mallory bodies very very important to remember okay mallory bodies are actually aggregates degenerated intermediate filaments these are nothing but what intermediate filaments intermediate filaments accumulating so very important steatoid hepatitis okay very nice we go further more okay now this i wanted to show you a schematic representation this is a hepatocyte okay and this is the nucleus of the hepatocyte and this is called macro microvesicular microvesicular cular steatosis steatosis or fatty change okay now this this actually will grow larger it will become like this and finally what you have seen over there is the nucleus is pushed to the to the periphery and these all the cells will have become macrovesicular shu sure. how the pathology becomes uh and this becomes larger and the nucleus is pushed and finally you see the cell becomes like this like a sigmoid ring cell okay now you if you want to really see more diagrams go to google put the fatty change you see lot of diagrams if you want to see more you can see your robins this just for your understanding okay yeah this particular thing again i told you very clearly explaining you uh this one as a you know uh, alcohol related cirrhosis you can see that green area uh, all this green area i'll just i'll try try to show you this this area this area is all fibrosis and this in between is called a regenerative nodule of the liver okay regenerative nodule so typical features of liver cirrhosis can be seen due to alcohol in the form of septal connective tissue that is fibrosis uh Uh, this, this actually they are trying to reconstruct with lymphocytic infiltration now you, you, inside you can see a lot of lymphocytic infiltration inside uh, with a macrovesicular steatosis this is basically going in favor of uh, this is a regenerative nodule this r uh, all, all the regenerative nodule is very important and the small the other cells you can see hepatocytes for your understanding again a good diagram again at a more low low power you can see histopathology of the liver cirrhosis all this is fibrous i'll just try to mark again for you the special stain over here you can see all this green area this fibrosis and this is a regenerative nodule okay this is again a regenerative nodule regenerative nodule regenerative nodule is very important so photomicrograph of the liver biopsy this is a there's a stain is called trichome stain or basin trichome very clear cut regenerative nodule composed of cluster of hepatocytes uh, extensive fibrosis lot of fibrosis and the if you just see the architecture is totally distorted very clear right you can see a regenerative nodule more high up now this is your slide for the examination we finished the fatty chain so one slide we have finished out of three slides okay now this becomes more easy to you now now you can see my dear students very nicely i just draw a diagram over i did a draw a line over here can you see the line this area this area this area now suppose if you see this is a limiting plate suppose there is a portal tract over here okay this this plate is actually broken up now the, these blue cells are 
not supposed to come over here. So you can see this area full of uh, uh, mononuclear cells and at occasional you can even see, see uh, eosinophils and neutrophils. <coughs> so when you see this, it's called inflammation, right? Inflammation, you people already are familiar with the words called inflammation. Whenever inflammation is there, you call it itis. Okay, itis. If you have inflammation of the stomach, you summarize gastritis, right? Okay, if you have inflammation of the meningitis, you summarize meningitis, right? If you have inflammation uh, of the tongue, you summarize glossitis, okay? Like this. If you have inflammation of the conjunctiva, you summarize conjunctivitis. You have inflammation of the appendix, you summarize appendicitis, right? If you have inflammation of the Soft tissue is some cellulitis. Like this, we have inflammation of the liver is some hepatitis. So one of the commonest cause of hepatitis is virus. Virus. So we got viral hepatitis. Mononuclear means what? Mononuclear means one nucleus. Lymphocytes, plasma cells, monocytes. Are the cool? Mononuclear. Okay. Uh, Lymphomatic cells, lymphocytes and plasma cells extend from the portal tract. Actually, suppose this here somewhere is the portal tract. It is disturbing the limiting plate. Now you have to know what you mean by limiting plate. That area of the uh, area where the portal tract ends and the uh, hepatocyte cord starts. So this is called the limiting plate of hepatocyte. So that area is totally ex uh, disturbed by the inflammatory cells, which undergo a lot of apoptosis. Apoptosis means single cell necrosis or pro pro programmed cell death, so called the interface. So that area, portal tract, portal tract, suppose it's a portal tract with the hepatic artery bile duct and suppose this like that and you know the hepatocytes are starting coming up over like that, like that. It, in, it is in cords. So this area is totally disturbed and you see a lot of inflammatory cells and this area become obscured, okay, by the inflammatory cells. We call this interface hepatitis or we call it chronic active hepatitis where you can see in virus B, and virus C also sometimes. So inshallah, uh, when we have time, if you don't understand anything from the textbook, when you read it, you can ask me by just taking a photograph in underlining or highlighting it with the marker, such that I'll try to teach you the specific uh, terminologies. We call it istilahat fil laghatul arabiya. Lazim tarif al kullu istilahat, sarahatan yani. Very clearly you can understand. So that is the thing, we honestly miss it many of the times. Chronic active hepatitis. Okay, we go furthermore. This is one of the slide you're going to get in the examination. Yeah, again, your slide. Individual hepatocytes are affected by hepat viral hepatitis. For example, viral hepatitis A is there, which is self-limiting. Rarely leads to significant necrosis. But hepatitis B, as I told you, very notorious. Can result in fulminant hepatitis. And fulminant hepatitis is very bad. And usually, the patient goes into death with extensive necrosis of the liver, we call it fulminant hepatic failure. So you can see over here with the arrow mark, you can see over in this area, and you can see even this area, if you have the understanding, this area, okay? We call it a large ballooning degeneration of the hepatocyte, very clearly, it's seen below the right arrow. At a lesser, uh, later stage, a dying hepatocyte seen shrinking down to form a, this is called a concealment body. Now this is again a very important MCQ which can come in the exam or in the practical we'll ask you if you want to give you more marks and we want to give you more special comments. I can ask you this. What do you mean by the dying shrinking isoflic cell? You some in the liver hepatosa, hepatitis or viral hepatitis. You some concealment body below the arrow on the left side. You can see over here. OK, that's all. Nothing more than that. OK, we have this one more from one of my collections uh, so of the slides. Now, this is actually basically you can see now. Now you people are experts. Now I'll tell you, I just mark down with for you people over like this. I'll mark down. OK, I like this. I'll mark down like this. Now, suppose this is the normal liver area. OK, uh, again, a normal liver area. OK, but this area is totally inflamed, right? Now, this area totally inflamed. This is actually from a, uh, our collection from a chronic chronic hepatitis B. So you have a chronic inflammatory infiltra. You can call this lymphocytes, uh, uh, plasma cells, and you can sometimes you can see occasional granulocyte in the form of, uh, uh, you know, in the form of neutrophil. The inflammatory uh, infiltrate is located interface of the portal tract. Now, this is actually 
does not enter over here inside does not enter over here so this interface hepatitis of the protract hepatic lobule okay uh, which is referred to as interface hepatitis so these features actually you see in the textbook of chronic hepatitis and that's very important for you to understand the pathology of liver especially in hepatitis so it becomes easy for you okay we go furthermore now you can see over here here also uh one second Yeah, this is again a very important diagram for you. Now, this particular thing which we have uh, underlined for you, this is this particular cells. I just wanted to show you how does it look like. Sorry. This area, this area. This is actually specially colored for you people. That's what nothing doesn't look like this. But you know, you can easily make out. Now, what is happening over here is again, I told you it's a chronic hepatitis B. Uh, most of the hepatocytes here have pale homogeneous ground ground glass appearance. So this is a very clear cut ground glass appearance. And if you read the textbook, you have this uh, uh, photograph as well as they call it ground glass hepatocytes. Now, these ground glass are seen in the hepatitis B infection or hepatitis B virus very clearly. OK. Uh, so ground glass hepatocytes, you can see over here this blue mark all looking like a ground glass very clearly are often in the chronic hepatitis B infection. That's what I wanted to show you. Now you can see hepatitis C. Now we finish with hepatitis B. That's only for the understanding, not for exam. Exam is very easy. You can just pass it. Hepatitis C, you have a lymphoid nodule. You can see this area, all the bile duct proliferation over here. And I just mark it like that. It becomes like a lymphatic lymph lymphoid nodule or lymphatic, you know, area of uh, collection of lot of lot of lymphocytes or in the form of lymphoid lymphoid nodule. So this is seen basically in hepatitis C. Again, I'll show you more such that you understand more. Now you can see histopathology over here of the hepatitis C showing lymphoid aggregate. So I'll just I'll just mark it for you aggregate here lymphoid aggregate very clear sir huh? so what is happening over here at the point of the end of the uh, you know uh, 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 inflammatory cells there's individual cell and the piecemeal necrosis okay you can see over here there's a normal hepatocyte but here there's a piecemeal necrosis so portal tracts are inflamed and they are full of collection of lymphoid aggregates you usually seen in the uh, hepatitis c infection but the ground glass is seen in hepatitis B virus. Remember, lymphoid nodules seen in hepatitis C virus. Very easy for your uh, uh, examination is going to come. Not this one. This will be very easy. Taiba, don't worry. Okay, we for go furthermore. Now this is very good from the. I took it from the Google. Uh, you can see at low magnification the lymphoid nodule in hepatitis C. Okay, lymphoid aggregate more higher power the same one in hepatitis C. So this is hepatitis C virus infection in the form of lymphoid nodules okay right okay now uh, we have this one uh, the, the last slide so we finished with fatty change we finished with viral hepatitis so out of the three slides you finish the two slides it's easy actually so the, the, the last slide is more easier cirrhosis is what is cirrhosis if anybody say it's a, a fibrotic uh, uh, accumulation of fibrous tissue in the liver this is okay no no problem you are correct, but we'll try to understand more better. It is an end stage chronic liver disease characterized by four changes, four fundamental features. What is it? Now, the first important is a diffuse liver affection. Yane, what do you mean? Whole of the liver is actually affected in cirrhosis of liver. OK, number two, there is diffuse injury. Almost all of the uh, hepatocytes are in in injured and some of the cells will go into necrosis of the liver cells. That is hepatocyte necros do occur. So this one. And then the third point is liver cell regeneration forming regenerative nodules. Now I don't want to go back. You remember I just tried to recollect from you like this, like this. There were fibrotic, fibrotic this thing. And again, it's something like that fibrous tissue, something like a fibrous tissue. In between you had a nodule of liver or liver cells inside like that. Remember? Uh, this is called a regenerative nodule. 
and these are the fibrous tissues where you can see in the textbook and what I've shown you. So this regenerative nodule, he's telling that liver cell regeneration forming liver regenerating nodule. Show father. Point with them. Okay. Now you can have this. Now the fourth point is the fibrosis and disruption of the whole architecture of the entire liver. So when you have this fibrosis, suppose the lobule was like that. You remember the lobule? This is a portal tract, portal tract, portal tract, portal tract, portal tract, and a portal tract. Now this was central vein. So due to due to the fibrosis, whole of this architecture is distorted. Okay, it's not very uniform. It becomes architectural distortion or disruption. So all these four features are there. We call it liver cirrhosis. That is diffuse liver affection, diffuse injury and necrosis of the liver cells, liver cell regeneration in the form of nodules. You can see over here nodules. And the fourth point is the formation of fibrotic strands or, or disruption of the architecture of the entire liver. How that could be some liver cell cirrhosis and you're going to see so much in your practice in the hospital. I think you people are understanding you people are mashallah, quite intelligent. If something you don't understand, you please ask me uh, if, even at the end of the lecture. There's a lot of time. I told uh, our brother Yusuf Jamil. He's so nice. Yesterday we had a talk with him, so we go furthermore. OK, now this is an additional slide for you. Just I wanted to show you what you ma mana steroid cells. OK. Very important point. It's a perisinusoidal cell. See, see this this area. This is a sinusoidal area. OK, and you know, I'll try to show you something called a space of DC. And this space of DC contains a steroid cell. You want to show Parallel and we call it perisinusoidal cell. It stores vitamin A metabolites. Very important for MCQ. It the steroid cells become activated in liver diseases. They secrete TGF beta. Tumor growth factor beta. Very, very important uh, uh, inflammatory mediator. It proliferates and produces fibrous tissue. So you, you need fibrous tissue and cirrhosis, right? So what is the cell which produces fibrous tissue and cirrhosis? You saw my eyes? Ah, the steroid cell. So it's a major contributor to the cirrhosis of the... I think he has taught you, Dr. Akbar is a very good professor, basically. OK, now common causes of liver cirrhosis. This we will ask you in the Viva Shafavi. Any disease that causes chronic long standing liver cell injury and necrosis will end up with cirrhosis. Alhamdulillah, we, we understood this area. So we'll not ask the, the, the list may be 25. We, I'll ask you only four things. What are the common causes of cirrhosis? You say viral hepatitis, alcoholism, iron overload, bilirubin obstruction, kifaya, jiddan, jiddan. For your whole MBBS training, Gifa Jiddan Jiddan. Halas. These are the common causes of liver cirrhosis in in what? Uh, liver cirrhosis in, uh, in in the, the in the hospitals. The commonest cause of liver cirrhosis. And we, are, we are not studying the rare causes. Okay, sorry. All right, very nice. Go so furthermore. Okay, what are the complications? We can ask you very fast of liver cirrhosis about 40 percent of the individual with cirrhosis are asymptomatic you should you should know this point uh, 40 percent of them are asymptomatic this can come in your mcqs and taiba until the late in the course of the disease in advanced disease symptoms and signs of hepatic failure i told you or fulminant hepatic failure can occur and the ultimate mechanism of death in most cirrhotic patients is progressive liver failure of course the detoxifying mechanism goes off the synthetic function of liver goes off. It, it, it cannot detoxify the substances. Ammonia goes to the brain and even the whole of the blood supply is disturbed, causing portal hypertension. And, you know, basically patient goes into hepatic encephalopathy and slowly over a period of time, the liver cirrhosis will develop hepatocellular carcinoma. For example, I just tell you that you saw a patient in a hospital uh, where, you know, there was a patient came with jaundice something and you know uh, when you do the test of ALT ASC that was elevated trans amino uh, were elevated and we do the hepatitis B was positive and he did not take the treatment he went off to the house after five years or ten years is returning with cirrhosis and he's not not least concerned after two to three years he de developed hepatitis and carcinoma now this is the pattern which is 
occurring in most of the patients in the whole world. So this is the idea of understanding the liver cirrhosis and ultimately leading to formation of hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay, complications of liver cirrhosis. As I told you, due to portal hypertension, you can see patient coming with ascites. In the hospital, you can see a lot of ascites. You have a lot of protosystemic shunts in the form of piles. You some are bavasir. Bavasir, okay? Uh, and you have esophageal viruses bleeding from the esophagus, splenomegaly, and also the fourth point I can add is caput medusae. Medusae around the umbilicus, you can see uh, engorgement of veins, all this area. And liver cell failure, you have edema fivorum ficullu jasad, yani. Generalized edema ficullu jasad. We come on ascites, uh, accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal cavity. You can have pleural effusions, accumulation of fluid in the pleural cavity. You can have left swellings, Vivaramangal uh, rigel and hepatic encephalopathy causing problems in understanding and orientation and asterixis. And finally, as I told you, hepatocellular carcinoma can occur. These are, the, these are different complications of liver cirrhosis. You will be seeing this in the hospital so much. So we go for the more. Okay, this is a, again, a, your slide is going to come in the examination. I might put this in the examination to give you 10 out of 10, such that you just say, what do you say? Doctor, I see a macronodular cirrhosis. The common, one of the commonest cause in Saudi Arabia and in the whole world is virus B and virus C. The most common cause is macronodular cirrhosis. And uh, I'll ask you if you want, I want to give you more marks, like I want to give you full marks still with the virus B and C. But I, if I ask you more causes, tell me Wilson disease, or alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency can produce macronodular cirrhosis. We don't need much more knowledge than this in the practical. That's all. And you need you need revision for Hansa Dagaik. That's all. Just before the examination, if you're understanding properly. Okay. Again, one, one more slide in your uh, 25 slide uh, uh, PowerPoint. This is an example of micronodular cirrhosis. These small things. Can you see the small things? Micronodules. Shuf Sarif Jiddan. Shuf Shuf Adha. Are kulu regenerative nodules grossly? They are very small, less than three millimeters in size. The most common cause is alcoholism. Alcoholism for the micronodular. For macronodular, antarif virus B, virus C, okay, and other things what you have seen over here. The most common cause in micronodular is the uh, alcoholism. The process of cirrhosis develops in over many years, maybe 10 to 15 years it takes place. Okay. Now again, a liver mi micronodular cirrhosis at a uh, gross level. Now this is an example of micronodular cirrhosis. Note that the liver is actually having a yellowish color or a yellowish hue, we call it hue, indicating that there is a fatty change and also called alcohol, uh, also caused by alcoholism. And this fatty change microscopically, you summarize steatosis. Okay, don't forget. Very very important. Okay, again uh, one more slide from your uh, from your uh, uh, PowerPoint. A close-up view of the micronodular cirrhosis. We made a little zoom up with the fatty change. Demonstrate of small. You can see very clearly small small nodules. Huh? This small small nodules. So many nodules. These are micronodular cirrhosis. May apart from the uh, Alcoholism can also be seen in Wilson's and primary biliary cirrhosis, Wilson's primary biliary cirrhosis, and even hemochromatosis. So if you can remember, remember. Otherwise, just tell for the micronodular tell alcoholism, for the macronodular tell virus B and virus C. Okay. Now again, this diagram just for your more understanding. I just want to color it for you. Now this is the fibrotic bands. Can you see all fibrotic bands over here? All the surrounding this one. Now this particular area, this one, this one, this round. Okay, and this round. Okay, see, this is a regenerative nodule. Regenerative nodule. So regenerative nodule plus fibrous tissue is equal to cirrhosis. Isn't it easy? Okay, so microscopically with cirrhosis, the regenerative nodules are hepatocytes surrounded by fibrous connective tissue that bridges the portal tracts, that's all. So all those portal tracts are totally disturbed. With this collagenous or fibrous tissue are scattered. Lot of inside, if you see, you can see, you can see over here, blue, blue cells. These are the scattered lymphocytes as well as lot of proliferation of bile ducts. So that's all. We don't need more than that. 
and this is the knowledge what you need the, for the examination. Okay. Now again, one of the slides from your uh, PowerPoint, micro, uh, we, we took it from micronodular cirrhosis. There is a fatty chain due to alcohol. I told you, you can see at the low power, you can see all these clear cells or, uh, or a macrovesicular steatosis, fatty chain. The two most important characteristic features are number one, regenerative nodule, number two, regenerative nodule plus fibrous tissue is equal to cirrhosis of liver. I'm repeating because you know you should not forget throughout your life the fibrous connected tissue extending between portal regions and surrounding the nodules. So may Allah bless you. I think this repetition will cause more understanding because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our Salah repeats Saradul Fatiha. Come times. How many times? So many times. So you know we repetition makes you perfect. Revision makes you perfect. So don't forget to do revisions. Okay, this is again a good slide. I've taken from uh, I think from Amboss. These are all, I'll just, I'll just show you. These are all the regenerative nodules, Shuf Sagir, Kabir, and, and all these are regenerative nodules, regenerative nodules, regenerative nodules, regenerative nodules, so much. And in between this tissue, these, these, these are the fibrous tissue. See, Kullu fibrous tissue. This is cirrhosis of liver. Okay, now this is a good diagram for you. Uh, can, can you understand, can you tell me what, what, what you are able to see over here? This is ultrasound, okay? Now there's something over here. Yishuf, I'll, I'll, I'll show you this. This is all additional. You don't need it for your exam. It's something black. And something over here you can see. At ultrasound, can you see? Now this is very good diagram of an ultrasound in a liver cirrhosis. Okay? Uh, heterogeneous liver parenchyma is seen. Uh, and you can see the liver, nodular liver. You can see the nodular liver margins. And this is ascites. This black thing is ascites collection of fluid and all these are nodules you can see liver, liver liver cirrhosis these findings are consistent with liver cirrhosis on on ultrasound you are not done a biopsy but you can much sure find out okay the same one uh, you can see you can see this a is the collection of the fluid ascites and this is the liver okay this is the liver this is the ascites okay very nice and through shu father Consider nodules, Juvah. How many nodules? You cannot count so much, so much. Very important, right? Okay, what is this? Another interesting for you. Any, any, anybody? Ultrasound of the liver with cirrhosis again. Now you see, you don't, you don't see fun and looking like this most of the times. You see all this area. Now this is a heterogeneous coarse parenchyma, nodular changes. I'll try to show you in a uh, overlay. Uh, it's, it's a grossly dilated biconvex organ shape. Okay, I go furthermore. The blunted liver margins. You can see the same one in a more overlay pattern. See enough so? You can see these arrows with the overlay pattern. Now green color gradient. Now this is a blunted liver margin, a biconvex uh, shape of the liver. Uh, these are consistent again with the cirrhosis of liver on ultrasound. Yeah, I'm, I'm, this is all teaching. I'm ex this is extra for your more understanding, okay? Don't have to worry much. Okay, now this is actually a gold standard. Uh, what is the liver, what does the liver biopsy do? It's very important for obtaining either a percutaneous or an ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration, uh, and it will give you the fibrosis stages to plan for proper treatment, okay? For it's especially for hepatitis C, virus and hepatitis B virus. So you have to uh, indicate stage number one, F1, stage number two, F2, stage number three, F3, stage number four, F4. Accordingly, they'll give the proper interferon therapy in, in, in the cirrhosis. And inflammatory activity, we call it A1 inflammatory, A2 inflammatory, and A3 inflammatory. And accordingly, we plan for the treatment. So biopsy is not necessary if the clinical and laboratory and radiological data strongly suggest presence of cirrhosis. Now the slides which I showed you before, if you can easily make it out by the ultrasound, the cirrhosis, you don't have to go for biopsy because biopsy is a very invasive technique, right? Very invasive technique, so you've got to avoid such things, okay? Now this is again from my taken from, from my, my files. Uh, you can see over here, cirrhosis, the gold standard is liver, liver biopsy, not required if the history is clear. 
clear from the history done when bi biopsy will not will manage the patient so biopsy is needed only when you, when the management want to proper management but once you can diagnose even on uh, biochemically and sonologically you don't have to go so imaging uh, techniques used is ultrasound mostly and ct and mri is very good but you don't have to spend so much of money uh, it, it shows a small nodular lever uh, not sensitive or specific for diagnosis mostly helpful for detection of hepatitis or carcinoma so if you want to detect hepatitis or carcinoma ct and mri is very good clinical diagnosis is very common presence of ascites very good point low platelet count very good point for diagnosis spider angiomata i'll try to show you one diagram very good point that you are suffering from a patient of cirrhosis clinically you don't have to really confirm it because clinical diagnosis or clinical uh, cardinal manifestations itself are so much to diagnose cirrhosis okay now we finished the uh, we finished our lecture i'll i'll give you two small cases i hope you can answer it okay a 51 year old man comes to the physician for follow up evaluation 9 months ago he was diagnosed with acute viral hepatitis b infection physical examination shows no abnormalities serum study shows increased transaminase activity transaminase means ast and alt and hepatitis uh b viral dna load was so much 4286 basically see 4286 units which of the following set is most likely in this patient the answer should be a or b or c or d or e or f there's only for your you know just to have an enjoyment tamatta fil yani whatever you have learned just to enjoy one or two cases two cases only that's then we'll finish it off anybody now see the patient who was previously had acute hepatitis b infection currently present with a uh, increased hepatic transaminases activity and a hbv dna load of 4286 most likely it has what it it is having from here you can make out that this patient is having active chronic hepatitis b virus infection sa huh? so what is the diagnosis chronic yes chronic yes why very good active chronic hepatitis hepatitis b virus infection yeah this is the one we'll take one by one a. a a is actually you can see over here in the e? a yes yes very nice i'll just uh, we'll take one by one yes yes it's e no 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 problem you're correct now if you take a what is a you have positive anti hbs uh, and igg and anti hbc with negative hbe is characteristic of the recovery complete recovery from acute hepatitis uh, b okay this is recovery from hepatitis b okay this is the one okay so recovery from the hepatitis b virus infection that is immunity due to this natural infection natural immunity natural immunity okay <clears throat> most adults who develop acute hepatitis b infection would recover completely most of them will recover completely and be a b asymptomatic as seen over here okay however hepatic transaminases in this particular case was uh, you know increased but here in this a will be normal and hbv dna will be undetectable for so this is number 1 is uh, normal immunity and hepatitis b recovery from re recovery because you have this hbc igg form that's all and anti hbc so nicely okay when we go to b what is b b is positive igg and anti hbc with negative uh, hbe ag and anti hbs is characteristic of inactive chronic hepatitis b infection that is 5 to 10% people will go into this one 5 to 10% people okay of adults who develop acute hepatitis b infection will develop chronic hepatitis b infection however patients with inactive chronic hepatitis b infection would typically have normal hepatic transaminases activity 
and HBV DNA load less than 2000. Here the load will be less than 2000. Here you can see more than 4000. Yeah. OK, now this is only positive. That's all. When you go to C. I'll try to show you one more thing. When you go to C, basically C, do you have a uh, positive anti HBS, right? With negative HBEAG and anti HBC is characteristic of immunity against hepatitis B as a result of vaccination. So this particular is a vaccinated patient. <coughs> vaccinated. How do you find out now anti HBS will be positive in vaccination? Now this is the only finding <coughs> you can do in the laboratory that if you have anti HBS, it is vaccinated. That's all. But when you go to D, you have positive IgM. You can see. You have positive. You can see over here D. It is positive IgM. Very important. Uh, anti HBC with negative HBE AG and anti HBS and IgG. Anti HBC is characteristic of the. This is actually a window period. OK, very important because you have this IgM. Very important this is a window period basically. Of the acute hepatitis we have V virus infection. This you have to detect in the window period. Others all will be negative. <clears throat> that is number D D patient. OK, this one. Sorry, I'll just mark it like that such that you don't you'll not get confused. OK, I'll not touch E because you already diagnosed it. We'll go to F. F what is F the last one? Positive HBEAG. See here it is positive. See positive. <clears throat> and IgM. It is positive here. OK. Uh, anti HBC with negative anti HBC is characteristic of what? Acute. Viral. Hepatitis B infection, right? Which would cause increased hepatic transaminases. AST and ALT will be increased at this level, OK? Uh, and increase HB, HB DNA load. But now you see HBEAG is positive here. That is this. The virus is replicating, replicating. Now this is very important to remember. So a different set of findings would be expected uh, in this asymptomatic patient who present with nine months of the initial episode. So this is actually how we go around. Now if you see this particular diagram, sorry. OK, this was the answering. What do, what, what do, you, what do you understand by this diagram? <clears throat> There's a very clear diagram of a serology of, of your diagnosis. What was the diagnosis? Active. Chronic, you told, mashallah, chronic. Hepatitis B virus infection. No? So the main serological feature of the active chronic hepatitis B is persistence of the HBV DNA. You can see over here, HBV DNA going like that. OK, it's very important. Is the presence of HBV DNA and antigens of the HBS AG also. You can see over here. You can see over here. HBS AG also and HBE AG despite a resolution. So this is also maintained because of the viral replication. It's very important, right? Uh, despite resolution of the acute infection. So transaminase levels, that is AST and ALT. You got to know this very important. Uh, may, may be normal or increase and fluctuate between periods of active and inactive chronic infection. So you got to treat it because when the AST and ALT increases more, the patient can go into a fulminant hepatic failure. And you got to treat it. So I hope you understand this small case for you and Marshall, you people diagnosed it. So this was the idea basically. This was the idea. Oh, the, OK, now this is your answer E and you, have, you people have diagnosed it and this was the HBEAG positive and anti HBC is well. So this is very important and in such cases you have a very high hepatic transaminase and uh, uh, high viral load here 4286. OK, so we go furthermore. OK. OK, well, last case we go for the last case. OK, a 59 year old man with a history of alcoholic cirrhosis is brought to the physician by his wife for a week for a one week history of progressive abdominal distension and yellowing of the eyes. For the past month, he has been irritable and has difficulty falling asleep become clumsy and fallen frequently. Two months ago, he underwent bending, banding for the esophageal viruses. So this banding point is again a clue, clue for something you're having. Esophageal viruses have an epi episode of vomiting, vomiting of blood. See, a patient already is telling alcoholic cirrhosis. Okay, abdominal distension, ascites, and yellowing of the eyes, icterus. Okay, 
very irritable, blood clumsy. Okay. Now his vital signs are within normal limits. Physical examination shows jaundice, multiple bruises, pedal edema, gynecomastia, loss of pubic hair, and firm and firm testis, small testis. Multiple small vascular lesions on the chest and neck that blanch with pressure. His hands are erythematous and warm. There's a flexion contracture of the fourth finger. I show you the diagram, a flapping tremor. Okay, I, I'm not in front of you. I would have wanted to show you the flapping tremor, you know, uh, uh, is seen when extending the forearms. Like you, when you press, uh, do an extension of the hand, it goes for tremor like this, okay? So abdominal distension shows dilated veins over the anterior abdominal wall. Maybe caput medusae. A spleen tip is palpated four centimeter down there in the left costal margin. That is splenomegaly and the shifting dullness on percussion. Which of the following pairs of physical examination findings are caused by the same underlying pathophysiology? Which of the following pairs of physical findings? Okay, go for the choices. This is the choice. Find the find the this thing. I'm waiting for the answer. And you can open your mic and tell me, no problem. It's easy, not very difficult. And C. Yeah, excellent. Very, very good. It is C. Super. So C is the answer. Palmer, erythema, and gynecomastia. So just to for your understanding, uh, when you see this particular case over here, I'll just go back. Okay, now the most clinical features of cirrhosis are, are either due to the failure of the liver to perform its normal function, that is altered bilirubin and sex hormone metabolism and decreased synthesis of protein and inadequate elimination of the nitrogenous based products are related to increased pressure within the portal venous system. So all these things are present over here. A very classical case of cirrhosis. Uh, I wanted to show you that one. And you know, when you go furthermore, uh, we'll read the choices such that it becomes so we'll read the choice where she has diagnosed it like a palmar erythema and gynecomastia now palmar erythema and gynecomastia both are features of what hyper estrogenism okay now this is very important now cirrhosis can result in hyper estrogenic state in which there is increased estrogen oblique androgen ratio this is likely to increase the peripheral conversion of the androgens to estrogens and decrease hepatic breakdown of estrogen in men's and and with cirrhosis. So these people will develop gynecomastia as well as increased increased binding of thus inactivation of the testosterone caused by increased amount of sex hormone binding globulin. So other features of hyperestrogenism uh, seen seen are what what are the other features? Spider angiometer i'll show you the diagram angiometer okay and loss of pubic hair loss of pubic hair all these features will go hand in hand palmar erythema gynecomastia spider angiometer and loss of pubic hair okay this is very important okay what about the jaundice and fla uh, flapping tremor now jaundice and flapping tremor although jaundice and flapping tremor are both associated with cirrhosis they are different they have a different underlying pathophysiology jaundice results from inability of the liver to conjugate the bilirubin which leads to unconjugated unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia flapping tremor on the other hand is seen in hepatic encephalopathy in which neurotoxic metabolites like ammonia accumulate in the central nervous system due to impaired hepatic excretion consequently neurotransmission of the joint uh, position sends the brain is totally impaired that's the idea basically. Okay. And what about the esophageal varices? Choice number D. We finish this one. This was the answer, right? This was the answer. Okay. Uh, esophageal varices and pedal edema are again associated with cirrhosis, but they have a different patho, different underlying pathophysiology. Esophageal varices with cirrhosis occur in portal hypertension because they are the site of portosystemic shunting of the blood, and pedal edema <coughs> may result from decrease hepatic synthesis of albumin which decreases the plasma oncotic pressure causing fluid to shift in the intravascular compartment into the peripheral tissue so this is very important what about the choice number e caput medusa and spider angiometer now although both caput medusa and spider are present in the cirrhosis again 
their abnormal dilatation of blood vessels are both astrosis and cirrhosis. They have different pathophysiologies. Spider angiometa may be caused by hyperestrogenism, I told you before, resulting in increase in the estradiol uh, to testosterone ratio. Caput medusae, on the other hand, is pathognomic of portal hypertension caused by protosystemic shunting of the blood. That's very important. Okay, anyway, we go furthermore, like we have the choice number F, testicular atrophy and abdominal distension are again associated with cirrhosis. Now see how the question comes. All are present with cirrhosis, but why? We are we, we got to match the pathophysiology. So it's very important, a pathogenesis and pathophysiology. So, you know, the testicular atrophy, both are cirrhosis, they have different pathophysiology. Hypogonadism in cirrhosis manifests as testicular atrophy. It's thought to be due to multiple factors like primary gonadal injury or suppression of the hypothalamic pituitary function as well as binding and inactivation of the testosterone caused by increased amounts of sex hormone binding globulin. So abdominal distension on the other hand is caused by ascites, very clear, and the complication of portal hypertension. The last choice, multiple bruises and loss of pubic hair, as I told you, also are present in cirrhosis. They have different pathophysiologies. In cirrhosis, hepatic production of the coagulation factors is impaired, okay, which can lead to coagulopathies and consequently easy bruising, which is present over here. You can see over here. So, and uh, the loss of pubic hair in chronic liver disease, however, is caused by hyper, uh, hyperestrogenism from an increase in the estradiol testosterone ratio. So, this was our question answer like that having palmar erythema together with gynecomastia, spider angiometa and loss of pubic hair. Such questions do come up in the big exam like SMLE. Uh, and mashallah, you people can score. You people are quite intelligent. I think uh, only two cases I just got for you. Uh, nothing more than that. Anyway, I have some diagrams for you. I'll just show the diagrams. What is this, any, anybody? This is called Dupuytren's contracture. You can see the flexion. You can see this. A flexion of the small fingers. You can see the flexion of the small fingers very clearly. You can see the flexion of the small fingers. So it's called Dupuytren's contracture. It is present in your uh, cirrhosis. Very nice. Okay. If this is all the features of cirrhosis. Uh, if you want, you can take a photograph of this one. All the things that there, what we have discussed in detail. I don't want to repeat it. Uh, mashallah. If you want to read more, you can just go to the internet and read about the child book scoring of this one, all this thing I discussed with you, all this thing etiology I discussed with you, prevalence and all the clinical features which are so important, okay? I go furthermore. Okay, what is this one, anybody? This is an endoscopic finding, esophagoscope. All these are esophageal varices. See, this is all thickening, esophageal varices. This bleeds, okay? So this is upper, upper GI endoscopy, dilated submucosal veins are visible. Okay, so, so you know, you, you have this red, red spots are there. We call it say red spots are visible on the viruses, suggesting and if you just, this breaks, suppose this breaks, there'll be massive bleeding. Patient can even die. So it's called esophageal viruses. Usually, usually she's seen in the portal systemic shunts called portal hypertension. Okay. Okay, what is this one, anybody? This is a spider, spider angiometa. Yeah, exactly. Spider angiometa. Angiometa. This is very important, actually. This, this, this is actually, if you know, you should describe this lesion like this. This is called telangiectasia, characterized by a vascular arcade branching out from a central arterial point. Spider angiomas are, can arise during childhood or pregnancy, as well as patients with liver disease and even thyrotoxicosis. So, this is very important. I think. That's thank you so much for your attention. If you have any doubt, I'll answer to you. But for your examination, don't worry. It's uh, it's a cakewalk, very easy. I hope you understand. For me, I told my F6 and F12 people, they can ask me any questions for you people, for the whole of the students sitting over here. If you can ask anything, just try to buy a, a, a Robbins and try to read all those cases which we are discussing in the nutrition metabolism and uh, read and if you don't understand highlight it and send it to me i'll try to send you the voice message if possible you can come on zoom where, whenever possible so it's a great privilege and honor for me to teach you and uh, anytime sir at your service ai khidma ai waqt barakallahu fikum ai sawalat asila
I think many people gathered. I don't know how many how many people came. Oh, 61, 70 people. No problem. Anyway, we recorded. I think uh, Dr. Yusuf Jamil. So you can send it to the people if if they really want it. Inshallah. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. Thank you so much for your attention. You can close Thank it, you. Dr. Yusuf Jamil, if you like it. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you.